Arroz al forn. Arroz del señoret. Uh, arroz, arroz and fesos y naps. Uy, I can't say that. Hello and welcome to another episode of Aprender Inglés con Reza y Craig. I'm Craig. And I'm Reza. And we're going to help you improve your English and take it to the next level with over 40 years of experience between us. As Reza likes to say, we know, we know a thing or two. So we're going to help you grow your grammar, vocalize your vocabulary and perfect your pronunciation. In this episode, academic English. But before that, I'd like to say a huge thank you to Juan Leva Galera, who has become a patron of this show. Some people have been asking us via email if we can supply transcripts for our podcast. And unfortunately, Reza and I both teach at the British Council. We don't have enough free time to write out all of the words that we say on the podcast. But we have discovered that uh, if we can raise, if we can get $100 per month, we will be able to pay someone to write the transcriptions for us. So that's what the patron program is trying to do. And thank you very much to Juan, who is contributing Um, some money every month to help us reach our goal of $100 per month. If you would like to join Juan and our other wonderful sponsors, go to patreon.com, that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash English podcast. Reza, I think we've got some feedback from our friend Elisa from Finland. Yes, hello, Elisa. We hope you're well and hope you're you're not too cold up there in Finland at this time of year. Wear plenty of warm clothes. Elisa <laughs> has sent us a message um, about the Christmas episode. She said, "You guys sang surprisingly well." Oh, you must be you. joking. Yeah, you're, we were terrible on She's that She's easily pleased, isn't she? She is easily pleased. We were terrible. Well, I was, I was bad. <laughs> oh, you were okay. I was terrible as well. Well, thank you, Elisa. She also gave some inside information on Santa's sleigh and recommends people visit the website santapark.com. Elisa said, Santa Claus lives here in the Santa Park with Mrs. Claus and elves. When I read that in the comments section on the website, Reza, I thought it was Elvis. I thought she said <laughs> Santa Claus lives here in the Santa Park with Mrs. Claus and Elvis. <laughs> I thought, what's Elvis doing with the um, with, <laughs> with Santa in the park? But uh, thanks for your message, Elisa. And if you want to listen to Reza and I singing rather badly, go to englishpodcast.com slash 82. Or you could listen to more professional singers <laughs> on that podcast singing typical Christmas songs. Craig, we also have a voice message from our good friend Mamen from Vieskas up in the Pyrenees. Oh, lovely. Hello, Mamen. I hope you're doing well. Hi, Mamen. She listened to episode 81 That was the one about British and American pronunciation differences. Uh, you'll find that at englishpodcast.com slash 81. Here is Mamin practicing the different pronunciation of American and UK English. Take it away, Mamin. Hi, Craig. Hi, Reza. This is Mamin. I've been listening to your podcast in my way to my work. And just in case I forget it, I want to say a thank you for your all of your podcasts and say also a Merry Christmas, just in case I forget because my mind is, you know, you know me. And so <laughs> and I want also to try to say something in American accent and in a British accent and here I here I go. Together 
Uh, <laughs> together. Forever. <laughs> Forever. <laughs> Just two words. I'm going to my work. Uh, a big kiss, big, hu big hug, and keep in touch. Bye. <laughs> Okay, so that was was Mamin. Thank you very much for sending that in, Mamin. Reza, what did you think of her um, recording showing the difference between British English and American English? Was there a clear difference between the sounds? To be honest, after hearing that recording, I couldn't really hear a big difference between the two. Mm, I agree. So actually, I replied to Mamin and I asked her to try again. So now this is Mamin's second message. Let's see if there's any improvement this time. Hi, Craig. Uh, this is Mamin again. Thank you for answering me so quickly. And um, I'm going to try again with the accent, with the British accent and the American accent. So here I go again. Together. <laughs> Together. <laughs> I'm going to try with little and little. Mm, with another one, with forever and forever. I don't know, I don't know right now, I don't have anything else. So, well, I'm going to work again, so bye, big kiss. Reza, what did you think of Mamen's second attempt? Well, I think there was a marked difference, a definite improvement, and yes, one a uh, version definitely sounded more British and one sounded more American this time. She's definitely improved. I agree. I agree. She definitely, with the R sound at the end and then with the R uh and the R, uh, she yeah. definitely showed the difference between the pronunciation. And I think that's a fantastic example of somebody who is practicing and repeating, recording their voice to improve their pronunciation. Mm -hmm. Another thing is the T sound in British English. In American, it's more like a D. She said, like, little and little. Yeah, mm. I could hear that. Yeah. So well done, Mamin. That's exactly what we suggest people do. Take the time to practice, record your voice, send it to us if you would like um, us to comment and give you some feedback. And just keep on, keep on practicing and keep on um, practicing your pronunciation. If you would like to listen to that episode again on the differences between US and UK pronunciation you can find it at inglespodcast.com slash 81 and if you would like to practice your speaking online with us you can go to inglespodcast.com slash blab and we'll be blabbing for an hour and practicing speaking usually every thursday We've got some more feedback, Reza, from uh, Jesus Vélez. Would you like to take this one? Okay, I'll read what he wrote. It was an email, I think, wasn't That's it? That's right, an email. An email. So he wrote, Hi, Craig and Reza. Hello, Jesus. Hello, Jesus. Thanks for your podcast. I think it's fantastic. It's a huge help for travellers. Mm, I think he means commuters. Yeah, people who travel from outside the city, usually into the center of the city to work. So they live outside of the center, but they take the train or the car into the center, are called commuters. They commute to work from Monday to Friday. Jesus says, my journey from my home to job, mm, but to say to my work. Yeah, is what's... about 120 kilometers. Wow. So it, he, his um, journey to commute lasts one hour. Or two podcasts. <laughs> yeah, perfect. <laughs> two podcasts there, two, pos two podcasts there, two podcasts coming back, four podcasts in a day. Fantastic. If you, you could squeeze in. Well done, Jesus. He goes on. I use your podcast to take my English to the next level. That's what we want to hear. That's what we want to hear. So he's taken our <laughs> introduction there. And we hope you're growing your grammar and vocalizing your vocabulary as well. He says, and perfecting your pronunciation. Of course, it goes without saying. Currently, he says, I'm preparing my C1. That's uh, an advanced level of English. Would you mind to speak? Ooh, Ooh, there's uh -oh. a grammar mistake. After, would you mind After would you mind? ING. Gerund. Would you mind speaking about academic English? 
For example, keywords I must use in the university with some colleagues, research concepts, paper, article, stay, fellowship, etc. I think there's a lot of material on the internet, but it's a disaster. There's no order at all. Thanks in advance. Excuse me for my poor English. And continue with the programs. Kind regards, Jesus Belef. Well, thank you, Jesus, for your question. And Reza, this is more your area because you taught academic English in Belfast, didn't you, for a few years? That's right. I worked at Queen's University and the University of Ulster in Northern Ireland, teaching academic English full time. So I do know quite a lot about it, Jesus. Uh, I have to warn you, though, it takes time. It takes time. You can't just learn academic English in a, a minute or an hour or two. It's like everything. It takes practice to become familiar with what it's all about. So what is it all about? What is academic English? Is it different to general English? Yes, it is. I would say that it's a different style of language. Academic English has certain key features which are not so typical in everyday general English. For example, academic English is more abstract, more impersonal, more structured and more organized, usually more formal when it's written, perhaps not spoken though, but certainly written it's more formal. It's often more technical because you might be writing about something in great detail at a very high level of education. So it's often more complex as well. And it avoids ambiguity because, for example, in science, we want to hear about the science. We want to know what are the facts, what are the findings, what are the conclusions. We don't want, uh, we don't want to be left guessing. So avoids ambiguity. And a very important feature, it may include references to other sources. That's very typical in academic English. In everyday English, you don't often quote or refer to other people when you're speaking or writing an email to your friend or something like that. But in academic English, it's very common to refer to the work or ideas of other people. So would you say that academic English tends to be more written, a lot more written than spoken English? Is it is it common to have spoken academic English apart from maybe in a lecture or a presentation by a professor? E, uh, well, I suppose there's when you go to university, for example, the bulk of the input expected from the student is written. But there are requirements for speaking as well. I mean, academic English style is, is generally evident in journals. They're like technical academic magazines, if you like, in textbooks, in essays, academic articles, in reports, uh, like scientific reports, for example, or research reports, in dissertations, in theses. That's true. That's a lot of different types of material which are written. However, academic English also is evident in spoken um, features of university life as well. For example, at lectures, there's a particular way of speaking in an academic way, or in talks. Talks are like kind of more informal and a smaller scale than, than lectures. Um, workshops, that's taller, you know, could be a mixture of spoken and written English. And some students would have to justify an essay or a thesis, so they might have to verbalize or speak about some written work that they've done. Yes, it's very common to have to give a presentation on a dissertation or thesis that you've done, a spoken presentation. And the style of language used in that spoken presentation will not be exactly the same as the style of writing in your actual piece of writing that you're talking about. So what differences would there be? Spoken academic English can be more informal. Right. It can be more informal, for example, for a presentation or in a tutorial. That's when you speak to your tutor. When it's one-on-one, -on -one, you and your tutor. One-on-one. -on -one. Well, mm -hmm. it could be a small group tutorial as well. Some mm -hmm. tutorials are like two, three, four, five, or maybe up to a dozen people. Some are one-to-one. -one. And um, since you're speaking uh, about problems or things you don't understand or clarification. Speaking uh, spoken English, like all spoken language and uh, spoken languages, 
can be more fluent, more fluid, and doesn't have to be so grammatically precise. Although there are still certain ways of making it academic. Right. And then there are seminars as well. Seminars is when students speak together about problems or issues. Conferences. So there, there's plenty of use of academic English for spoken situations as well. So, um, Reza, what what kind of examples can you give? What differences are there that make, um, or what features make academic English? Are there any typical grammar features or vocabulary features that that stand out or um, make make academic English so so obvious? There are there are five or six things I would pinpoint. To pinpoint means to to distinguish as to focus on focus on them Mm -hmm. the first thing is um academic english is all about the subject be that be that that means it doesn't matter if it's physics history music chemistry sociology the subject's important you you're not important it's the subject that's important so you avoid personal pronouns such as i me you us you you don't say that I did a survey. Yeah. yeah. You don't say, I did a survey. You say, a survey was carried out. So you change it to the passive and remove the pronoun. Uh, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So indeed, that brings me to my second point, the passive. The passive is uh, another very, very, very common thing. For example, as you, you just said, rather than saying, I didn't, rather than saying, I wrote, no, what did you say? I did a survey. Rather than saying I did a survey, it's better to say a survey was carried out. Or instead of saying I asked a uh, hundred people, a hundred people were asked. Exactly. Because it's not important that I asked them. It's important that they were asked. Exactly. Or imagine a chemistry experiment. Uh, it's better to say the liquid was heated to 20 degrees, was heated. Now, who heated it? You did in the laboratory. But as I said, we don't care about you. Doesn't we only matter. care about what happened to the liquid. I don't so matter. The liquid was heated. Or it can be seen that the species evolved. This could be um, zoology. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't care if you understand that the species involved you. We just care that it's something that can be observed. So it can be seen. Not I can see. Uh-uh. It can be seen. And what happens to contractions? I mean, are contractions common in written academic English? No, Uh, because, as I said earlier, we want to be generally formal or semi-formal at least, then avoid contractions. So uh, say um, the sentence, it will not be resolved. Don't say won't. Mm -hmm. It will not. Won't is contraction. Best to avoid that. Or the conclusions are not definitive. Instead of aren't, better to write are not. However, when you speak, like when you're giving an academic presentation, you could use contractions in your spoken English, but written, avoid them. Right. And is there any preference um, whether to use verbs or nouns or doesn't it matter? Well, of course, you have to use some verbs and we've talked about using passive verbs. That said, that said means sin embargo, uh, it is best to use lots of nouns, a process which they call nominalization, using nouns rather than verbs. It sounds more academic. So, for example, a, a good academic sentence might contain the words blah, 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 blah. The Norman invasion of Britain in 1066, provoking a huge linguistic change. That sounds very academic. That sounds very academic. What it really means is when the Normans invaded Britain in 1066 and it provoked a huge change. But rather than saying when the Normans invaded, past simple of the verb to invade, I said the Norman invasion of Britain. Invasion is a noun. And rather than saying it provoked a huge change, provoked is a verb, I said provoking, it's a participle, provoking a huge linguistic change. I've avoided using a subject and verb. Mm -hmm. That's nominalization. It's quite typical 
of academic English. So using more nouns and gerunds as nouns rather than verbs. Exactly. Another very important aspect of academic English is to use plenty of linking words. Or you could say to signpost your discourse. To signpost. Well, what's a signpost? Well, a signpost helps you to navigate through things and lets you know where you are. Because if you don't know where you are in the world or in a text, you could easily get lost. So signposting in academic English, I would guess, is just clearly showing and explaining where you are in sequences. And where you're going. And where you're going in a text. Exactly. So what kind of words would would a student use to signpost? Well, the typical things we signpost uh, when we write and indeed speak in academic English are for listing things, for adding information, uh, contrasting things or using a concessive clause. Can you give some examples? Okay. So let's say listing, for example. So when you've got several points to make in an essay or academic article report or whatever, the first point you're going to introduce probably with a word like firstly Mm -hmm. or to start with. The second point could be secondly. And then the third, fourth, fifth could be next. Um, If you've got more points, a further point. And then the last point could be finally or lastly. All of those are typical signposting linking words, which show, as Craig said earlier, where we're going. Firstly means, here comes my first main point. Here it comes, coming up after the word firstly. If you hear the word a further point, you know, okay, I finished the previous point, here's a new point. And if you hear the word lastly, your brain automatically knows, okay, here's another point, and it's the last point. There'll be no more new points after this. We're coming to the end, yeah. Yeah. And that technique, I think, with firstly, secondly, is also very useful when you're speaking if you don't want somebody to interrupt you. So you could say, oh, there are two things I'd like to say about that. Firstly, and if you say that, then people know there's a second thing coming or a third thing coming. So it's very useful when you're speaking or presenting to let people know there's something more coming. It could prevent an interruption. Exactly. Like in a presentation, uh, it's very common for students to have to give a presentation of, no more than 10 minutes or 15 minutes. It's very common. So the time's precious. So the very first thing you normally do in an ac- academic presentation is to say, this is what I'm going to do. Firstly, we're going to talk about this. Next, that. Lastly, that. And then at the end, you can ask me uh, any questions if you have any. So let's begin. So the listeners know, okay, I don't interrupt now. I'll get a chance at the end after the three points and the conclusion. And that's signposting a presentation. Signposting, very important aspect. Another thing is to add information. For example, let's say I want to talk about why I like Valencia. Well, I find why why do you like Valencia? Well, Valencia is uh, is attractive for many reasons. Firstly, there's the weather, of course. Moreover, moreover, the cuisine, the gastronomy is very interesting. Moreover, is to add information. Además, además. So we got moreover, in addition, or in addition to, additionally, furthermore, what is more. All of those are typical words to add information. So I I love the weather in Valencia. It's sunny and it's warm most of the time. What is more, it has a beach so you can enjoy the weather on the beach most of the year. Valencia is not an expensive city. Additionally, it's very flat, so it's nice to ride a bicycle. Mm -hmm. Other words uh, could fall under the category of, let's call it, Contrast or concession is kind of the same thing. Contrast is obviously to contrast two things which are not similar. And concession is to talk about two uh, contradictory aspects of the same thing. For example, although I love the weather in Valencia most of the year, in summer it's a bit too hot at times. That's called concession. Or, so I'm using what's called a concessive clause. So I'm talking about just one thing, the weather in Valencia, but two aspects of it, 
the good bit and the bad bit. So although would be onke. Onke, yep. Yeah. And when so although blah 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 is called concession. Rather than contrast, I'm not contrasting two things. I'm only talking about Valencia. I'm just saying that there's a good aspect and a bad aspect aspect of Valencian weather. But let's put them all into the one category because they're kind of similar. Contrast and concession. Words like although or however, nevertheless, nonetheless. Can you think of any more, Craig? What about um, whereas, um, despite or in spite of, and whilst? What's what? How would you say whilst in Spanish? Mientras. Mientras. Yeah. Whilst is really the same as while. It's just a little bit more formal. Right. And a little bit more academic. So it's a good uh, linking word to use in an academic um, article. Yeah. Uh, whilst can also be a time expression. Like Whilst um, I was cooking the dinner, my wife was watching TV. Whilst can refer to time or it can refer to concession. Mm-hmm. Same as Spanish, mientras. Mientras me encanta el tiempo, eh, también no me gusta sudar tanto. So mientras in Spanish can be both for time and for concession. What about albeit? It's one word, A-L-B-E-I-T. That's a good word. That's a great word for academic writing. Albeit is formal and it means the same as uh Although I've said one thing, here comes the contradiction. Mm-hmm. Or take into account what I've said before, because now I'm going to say something um, which seems to contradict what I've said or go against it. I'll give you an example. Valencia is a very interesting, lively, vivacious city full of life. Albeit that it's only got about 800,000 people, it seems like more. So albeit means taking into consideration. Yeah, so yes, it's small, I admit that, but it has plenty of life. So albeit means taking taking into consideration Mm -hmm. what seems to be a contradiction. So a pasar de or aun cuando, aunque. Aunque, something like that. What about, have we spoken about um, be that as it may? Or on the other hand? Mm-hmm. On the other hand, it's fairly common. Be that as it may? Well, one second, because on the other hand is often confused by Spanish speakers. They say on the other side because mm, por otro not... lado exactly. is uh, a confusing direct translation. It's on the other hand, por yeah. otro mano. And on the other hand, often is preceded by on the one hand, but not always, Mm -hmm. not always. You can say, on the one hand, the weather in Valencia is great most of the year. On the other hand, it's too hot in summer and you want to get away from it. Yeah. So on the one hand, often comes first before on the other hand. Not always. What about the expression then, be that as it may? Eh, Aunque sea verdad. I would say in Spanish, something like that. That could say, for example, I love traveling and I love visiting different places around the world. Be that as it may, it can be a bit expensive when you travel every year. So you're like uh, mentioning the two different aspects of traveling. Yeah, fantastic. The positive but and the negative. the other negative. side, it's expensive. Yeah, there's a drawback. Mm-hmm. We got one more word, notwithstanding. Now Ooh, there's a word. That's Ooh, a good one. Not that's level, withstanding. Level C two. Jesus, <laughs> you probably never even heard that in C one. That's a C two plus. Definitely a formal word, and it's definitely one, it's, an academic word. It's one word. It's all together. Not with and standing. Yep. All together. Notwithstanding. Yeah. What does it mean, Reza? It means pretty much the same as although. Okay. Yeah. So let me give you an example. Uh, go back to the weather in Valencia, since we already know that as our example. The weather in Valencia is famously mild and pleasant most of the year. Notwithstanding, there are a few unpleasant weeks in the summer when it's too hot. Notwithstanding. And Although, there'd, there'd be a comma after that, wouldn't there? Yes. Yeah. Words which uh, of, a, of um, contrast and concession, which are usually followed by a comma, 
are moreover, comma, in addition, comma, additionally, comma, furthermore, comma, um, however, comma, nevertheless, comma, nonetheless, comma. People forget those commas when they're writing, don't they, very often? Yeah. And notwithstanding, comma, uh, be that as it may, comma, on the other hand, comma. Comma, yeah. Many of the most, they're usually followed by commas, as they say. Not always, but usually. Another category is giving examples. This is very important in academic English. If you're talking about, um, you're trying to justify an opinion or explain something, uh, you may have to write at length lots of words. So you've got plenty of time to give examples of what you're trying to uh, convince the reader of. So obviously you can say, for example, por ejemplo, but as a little variation, you could substitute the word instance. For instance, it's a tiny little bit more formal and sounds good in academic English. It's also good not to repeat the same words again and again through through your essay. So maybe use, for example, in one paragraph and for instance in the next. Another good one is as an example or as one example. So uh, Valencia is famous for its rice dishes. As an example, arroz al forn. Oh, did you think I was going to say paella? No, there are lots of rice dishes in, in Valencia. Arroz al forn, arroz al horno. I thought you were going to say arroz al horno, yeah? I could go further and say, as another example, arroz del señoret. What about that? Arroz del señoret is rice with seafood and all the seafood has everything taken off it so that it's prepared for el señorita. What about the one with turnips that they say in Valenciana that's really difficult to say? Can you say that? Uh, arroz, arroz and fesos y naps. Oh, yeah, I can't say that. Yeah. Anyway, what else? As exemplified by, there's another one. So we could say there are many rice dishes in Valencia as exemplified by arroz al forno, arroz del señoret, arroz mm. a banda, paella, etc. etc. To illustrate is a good one as well. To illustrate, there is a very wide variety of rice dishes in Valencia. To illustrate, I will start by naming one with seafood, arroz al banda, one with Meat, arroz al forn, and one with neither fish nor meat, ar, uh, paella vegetariana. There you go. Would you say to illustrate and then the thing or to illustrate this? Could You could add the word this, yeah, mm -hmm. to illustrate or to illustrate this or to illustrate that or to illustrate my point or something like that. And Depends. what would you say if you wanted to point to a person who has said something clever about something? So you're giving a name and maybe a year of a paper that somebody's written. Mm -hmm. How would you suggest people do that? Well, let's say there's an author called John Smith. So I've been writing about things which John Smith also wrote about. And his books or comments or thoughts are famous. They're well known in the academic world. So I might say, according to Smith, and then if he wrote a book, um, or he may have written several books, but the book I'm interested in or the publication, maybe it's a journal or, or a report, whatever, I write the year of it. So I write, according to Smith, and then in brackets, the year of publication, 1987. That's when he wrote the book that I'm going to talk about. According to Smith, Valencian rice dishes go back to the 17th century. Imagine Smith has written a book on Valencian rice dishes. Accor according to Smith, there are so many dishes, rice dishes in Spain, you could, in theory, eat a different rice dish every day of the year. Or we could say it a different way. As Smith, 1987, said, you could eat a different rice dish every day of the year. Or Smith, 1987, wrote that or stated that you could eat a different rice dish every day of the year in Spain. So those three are variations, and there are a few others, of reference, of referring to the words or written or spoken or the thoughts of someone worth referring to, someone who knows what they're talking about. They someone, may already be Someone famous. who knows their stuff. Don't quote your grandmother who, if she's not <laughs> an expert in the field. Do quote her if she's an expert, by all means. 
According to my not. mate down the pub. <laughs> <laughs> Don't write that in an academic essay. <laughs> and of course, the last category, logically, to talk about must be conclusions. Um, so you've written your essay, you've given examples, you've listed things, you've compared and contrasted things, you've given examples of reference, then you've got a conclusion. So and this will be in the final paragraph or the final two paragraphs. Yeah, or near the end, depends how long it is. Yeah. So you're going to signpost to the reader or the listener at a presentation or a seminar that you're coming to the end by saying, in conclusion, or writing, in conclusion, to conclude, to sum up, you think of any more um all in all Mm -hmm. um in short perhaps Mm -hmm. or in brief b-r-i-e-f in brief and again there'd be commas after these wouldn't there yeah comma and then here comes the conclusion so it's a signpost it's like a signpost stuck in the middle of the road saying uh, Dublin 100 miles this way so you know that if you go in that direction following that sign In 100 miles, you'll get to Dublin. So you know that when you get to the words, in conclusion, to sum up, in short, that if you follow that, you're going to the conclusion. So the reader reader or the listener knows that you're closing your your speech or your writing and you're coming to the end. The end is near. Exactly. Remember, all of these words and expressions will be in our show notes at inglespodcast.com slash 87 yeah. Yeah. and we are going to continue in a few minutes with academic english but first we'd like to thank our sponsor italki.com now reza i think you've tried italki recently with your french studies Can you tell us about uh, your experience with with your French teacher on italki. What happened? Yes, a few weeks ago, I had a lesson on italki with Justine. Justine. Justine, uh, my French teacher on italki. And I plan to have further lessons with her. I've just been a bit busy. I'm a very bad student, but I will be having more lessons with her because I was so impressed with the, with the trial lesson that I had with her. Where is uh, Justine from? Justine is from France. Uh, Not all the French teachers are from France because French is spoken in many countries. And I had the chance, first of all, to look at the the list of those uh, teachers on italki who offer French, see their profile, see where they come from, um, how many lessons they've already given on italki, see how many years experience they've got. And there were teachers from France, from Belgium, from Switzerland, from Algeria, from Morocco, from Senegal. What did you talk about with Justine when you had the lesson? Did you Was it fluency practice? Were you just speaking with her? Because your, your French is quite intermediate now, isn't it, at least? Apparently, according to the Institut Francais, where I study French in Valencia, I'm a B1 level, but I, I would say I'm the weakest in the class. So although I go to classes, I feel I need extra, extra speaking practice. That's what drew me to using italki services. And Justine was perfect for that. We spoke the whole time. She asked me questions. You spoke in French them. the whole time? Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, once or twice for a few seconds, we got stuck. And so as not to waste any time, we reverted to English. I was lucky that she also speaks very good English. That's something that I found out by looking at her profile on italki, Mm -hmm. because I wanted that as my kind of emergency net, because I didn't want to waste time. And I had to use it once or twice. Uh, We talked about daily routines, a little bit about my background, because it was our first class. I opted for the trial, which is just a short class, just to see if I liked it. And I was very happy with her. So now I'm going to have a full lesson schedule. Um, As well as talking, she sent me via Skype documents related to what we we talked about, which I have to do for homework and uh, to help me write and read. And then we'll talk about them further in, in our next class. So it was a really good experience. Really happy with it. That's lovely. That's lovely to hear. And because they're our sponsor, if you're interested in taking lessons, English lessons, obviously, 
or French with italki. Um, they're offering 100 free credits if you sign up through our webpage at inglespodcast.com slash italki. So for every paying student that registers, they will give you 100 free credits. And we would like to thank italki very much for sponsoring Aprender Inglés con Reza y Craig. Okay, so moving on with academic English, Reza, um, let's look at some typical university campus terms because uh, let's clarify what uh, what students may hear around university campus. Mm -hmm. So as I'm sure most listeners know, because it's more or less the same in Spanish, a campus is where the university is located. Um, it in includes not only their classrooms, but it could include other facilities. And how is the university divided? Well, there are usually several departments in one faculty. For example, uh, the Department of Physics could be in the science faculty, along with the chemistry department and the mathematics and other departments. So right. Department within faculty. There's one thing that students might be a bit confused about, and that's the different kind of degrees that you can get at university. So they have, there's the bachelor's degree, isn't there? That's one. Mm -hmm. How would you explain the bachelor's degree? Bachelor's degree is your first degree. And then there's a master's degree. A master's degree comes after your bachelor's degree or, or it's a bit longer than a bachelor's degree. By that, I mean that what you can do is either first do a bachelor's degree then add a year or two to that to um, complete a master's degree. Or these days, some people often uh, just start directly their first year on a master's degree. So you don't necessarily have to have a bachelor's degree in order to get a master's degree. No, these days it's very common from, for you to start the master's degree, degree right from the beginning. In other words, it's going to be longer than what a bachelor's degree would have been. So let's say if a bachelor's degree is normally three years in the United Kingdom, if you start a master's degree right from the start, it's going to be four or five years. Right. Uh, another option is to do a bachelor's degree of three years and then add a year or two after that to make it a master's degree. It would, of course, depend on the subject, um, on how long the course would be. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. yeah. You don't always get to choose one or the other. Sometimes you're obliged to do bachelor's or master's. So I heard some people say, oh, I've got a BA or I've got a, an MSc. What do they mean? Well, as an example, a BA is a Bachelor of Arts. So if I say she has a BA in history, she has a Bachelor of Arts degree. And remember that degree is carrera. Career is not carrera. Mm -hmm. Degree is carrera. Okay. Or I could say, he's doing an MSc, that's capital M, capital S, small c. He's doing an MSc in mathematics. MSc is Master of Science. He's doing an MSc in mathematics at Oxford, for example. So the preposition is in, so it's an MSc in mathematics or a BA in history. And then the university at at Oxford, at Cambridge, at the University of Valencia, at Queen's University Belfast, at the University of Ulster. Just plug in the places where I used to work. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're studying, remember that you would say in English, I'm doing a degree or I'm studying at university. You wouldn't say I'm studying a career. So don't uh -huh. translate, as Reza said before, don't translate carrera to career. Your career begins after you leave university. Craig, what would you call study even above a master's degree? That would be a doctorate, to do a doctorate um, or a PhD. Um, what, does, uh, what does that mean? I uh, think a PhD is a doctor of philosophy. That's it. So PH is philosophy and D is doctor. Capital P, small h, capital D. Right. So that's the highest postgraduate university qualification 
requiring a few years of study could be two, three, four, sometimes five or six years to pass a doctorate, to pass a PhD. And it usually involves research and it will involve writing a doctoral thesis, Whoa. which would be a long piece of work, which must be written in an academic style. It could be, ooh, it varies a lot. Could be 100,000 words, 200, 300, 4, 500,000 words. That's almost a book. Yes, it pretty much is like a book. So a postgraduate is a person who's studying on a higher course after passing or getting their first degree, right? Yes. So the... Postgraduate studies. Yes. So an undergraduate is a student studying on a bachelor's or first degree course. And then a graduate is a person who has completed a bachelor's degree course. And as Craig said, a postgraduate is a person who is studying on a higher course after passing their first degree. Um, So they can all be people. He is a graduate. She is a graduate. They are postgraduates. Or these terms can also be used as adjective. I'm studying on a postgraduate course. Mm -hmm. Or they are doing an undergraduate course. They can be nouns for the people, or they can be adjectives to describe another word. Sometimes you hear the noun a fellow, F-E-L-L-O-W. What's a fellow? Well, Craig, you tell me, if I said to you, uh, Lisa, just... You're you're a good fellow, you're a good chap. I tell you what, just for Elisa, (laughs) since you praised us, Elisa, Elisa, for he's a jolly good Good fellow, fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow, and so say all of us, us. is a very old traditional English song to show your appreciation of someone. He said, jolly good fellow. He's a good person. A good person. A good sort. Yes. That's the... Un buen tío. Un buen tío. Un buen tipo. That's a fellow in everyday English. But we're not talking about everyday general English. We're talking about academic English. And in the academic world, a fellow is someone, man or woman, who temporarily teaches or researches or both and perhaps still even studies on a postgraduate course at a university. But they're not a full lecturer. Mm -hmm. They're not a full lecturer. A lecturer is uh, a person who gives lectures and and a fellow is not quite as high as that in the rank of in the class staff. system, the class university class system. <laughs> yes. So you often hear um, fellowship, mm-hmm. which I assume is the job that's given to a fellow. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And fellows are normally very busy people. They're researching, they're teaching, and they're perhaps studying for their own doctorate at the same time. Um, so as we said, a lecturer is a person who gives lectures at a university. They're above a fellow. How would you describe a professor, Craig? Well, it's easy to translate professor to professor in English, but it isn't a true translation because a professor, I'd say, is a bit higher than a teacher. It's uh, an experienced, a very distinguished lecturer or a more senior lecturer, not not the same as a teacher. So we we are teachers, we're not professors. Professors generally work at a university, a recognised university, and they have a kind of a higher standing or a higher uh, class than a teacher. Would you agree? Yes. Uh, and so does a lecturer. A lecturer mm-hmm. also has a higher standing than a teacher. And a professor, professor is like a more distinguished, more experienced lecturer even. So professor is the Top of the pile. And how, do you, how would you say Becca in English? If the government or um, some local authority give you money to help you study? A grant. Money to support students throughout the year. Depending on your financial situation. Now, when, when I went to university quite a few years ago, most of me and my uh, classmates got grants. I bet we wouldn't these days. The did you Did you get a grant to go to university? Oh, yeah, yeah. I but didn't know. Most people did. Most mm-hmm. people did. 
in the late 1980s. But nowadays, most people don't. They've made it harder. Yeah. So the grant is the money which the government pays, but it depends on your financial situation. And your parents' situation, how much money they're earning. Yeah. yeah. But by your, I mean really your family, because at 18, 19, 20 years old, you're not going to have much money. But if your parents have uh, what the government consider a lot, they're not going to give you any money. If your parents don't have a lot, but you got a place at university, the government is going to give you more money. That money is called a grant. So what's the difference between a grant and a scholarship? Because well, the scholarship is also money that you get to study. Yes. And you said Becca as well. Yeah, they both could be translated as Becca. Although for me, Becca is a better translation of scholarship than grant, to be honest. A scholarship is not usually given by the government. It's money given by a university or college or school or even a company, a business. And it's given to a student because they won it in a competition or because they're poor but very talented. It's very common in America, isn't it? If you're a very good baseball or basketball player or football player, you'd get a scholarship to go to a college or university or college in, in, in America and play sports. So, so how does it work? Who, who pays the money? The, who pays for your fees, your college fees? The college would pay because it's in their interest to have a really strong sports team. And what's the catch? What does the student have to do? I think they have to have a minimum level of academic... But that's not what I mean. What do they have to do well, they have for to the commit, university? They have the to play. They have to commit right. to a number of years playing for the college yep. in order to get the scholarship. Now, I know if you're not from the United States, it's, it's hard for you to get your head around that. But that's how it works in the United States. If you're a very good sports player, mm -hmm. even if you're academically not that great, you can still get into college yep. without having to pay any money if you play sport for the college. And you might be thinking, oh, it's only for the college. Ooh, you would be mistaken. College, university, sport is extremely important in the United States. And it earns a lot of money for the college because there's yeah. advertising, that is on TV, there's TV rights and advertising and uh, all sorts of money connected to promotion of the college team. And that's the stage where professional players are learning to become really, really good. They're almost kind of semi-professional. So by the time they leave college, they'll be ready to join the professional baseball or basketball or American Football League and earn millions of dollars. So it's very important business. Very different to Europe, isn't it? Yeah. There are no such sports scholarships that I know of in Britain, or if there are, they're not very common. But in America, they're standard practice. Or in Britain and America and Spain and all over the world, what is more common is for companies to give you a scholarship with the understanding that you will work for them when you graduate from university. So they say, okay, you haven't got a lot of money. We'll pay the fees, but you must work for us for, let's say, five years after you graduate. And sometimes they, they have conditions like if you don't graduate, you have to give us the money back. It's quite a common condition. So you better graduate. <laughs> Craig, where would you find the halls of residence? The halls of residence, um, well, that's the accommodation on the campus, on university. So it's, uh, it's a large block of living accommodation, living area where the students would, uh, would sleep and often eat and socialise. The official university accommodation on the campus. Craig, who is the person in charge of the whole university? Who's the top person in the, in the staff? In America, I know it's the dean, the dean of a college. Right. And in UK universities, um, can't remember. The vice chancellor. Really? Yes. The vice chancellor. Which sounds... Not the chancellor. No, that's the weird thing, isn't it? Who is the chancellor? Well, most universities don't have a chancellor. So that, can that be a, a man or a woman, I'm assuming? Yes. 
Yep. So when you hear the word vice in English, vice something like vice governor, vice chairman, it's usually the number two in command, right? Right. Uh, or viceroy, virrey. Like in Spanish, the viceroy is not the king, rey, but the viceroy, the number two, representing the king. That's true. However, it's a misnomer. It's misleading in the university world because the vice chancellor is not number two, but number one in command. It's a strange terminology. So what's number two? Number two in command is called the pro vice chancellor <laughs> or deputy vice chancellor. Or PVC for short. Yeah, PVC, which also is a polyvinyl chloride. Plastic. Which is plastic. plastic. Yeah, yeah, it's PVC. Or deputy vice chancellor, DVC. And the boss, vice chancellor, VC. Interesting. What about the initials HE? What do they stand for? Um, higher education. Mm-hmm. Which is, is that primary or secondary? Secondary, be higher than primary and secondary education. So we're talking about, as higher education, we'll be talking about university education in the UK. So universities, colleges, maybe a specific uh, school, like a medical school or, or something like that. Definitely higher than primary and secondary. Yes, everybody knows the words primary and secondary. And then higher education is tertiary. Tertiary means number three. Mm-hmm. Tertiary is a synonym for higher education. Well, um, Jesus, I hope those basic words uh, will give you a little bit of understanding for everyday talk um, in and life in the campus. Reza, are there any places we can send Jesus or anybody else who has an interest in academic uh, vocabulary so that they could study more words like this? Yes, for further details on academic vocabulary, because it's such a huge area, I've put in a few links in the show notes. Uh, the first link uh, goes to the academic word list, the AWL. Anybody who has ever been involved in academic English will know about this list. It's extremely important. It's a list of the most commonly used words which tend to repeat and repeat and repeat in academic writing and speaking, the academic word list. That sounds very useful. And Reza, when you worked in Belfast at Queen's and the University of Ulster, did you use any specific books that you could recommend to people? I did. Um, I'll put a link into the show notes. I used a very good book uh, about academic writing by uh, Oshima and Hogg. It's well known. Uh, it doesn't doesn't sound very English. Sounds Oshima sounds more Japanese. Yeah, I, I was going to say Japanese it's, writer. It, p- possibly they have a Japanese origin. So Shima and Hogue, they're writing academic English. Um, and then if you are presenting for spoken English, a book called Presenting English: Successful Presentations. Um, and then a book for self study, um, academic vocabulary and use. Uh, it's very similar to. Uh, a series called English Vocabulary and Use, which I often use at the British Council and other teachers as well, for general English vocabulary. But academic vocabulary in use is the same, but specifically dealing with academic vocabulary. I've put in an example of a chapter from that book, if you want to if you wanna have a look at it. It's all in the, the show notes. And one last thing. TED Talks, which you should know about even if you're not interested in academic oh, English. TED Talks are wonderful. They're really, really good. they're really good even for general English, aren't they? That's right. I often watch TED Talks on various subjects and you can find TED Talks at ted.com slash talks. And all the other links that we've spoken about in this podcast can be found at inglespodcast.com slash 87. And now it's your turn to practice your English. We would like you to tell us if you've had experience of academic English. Have you been to university? Do you have a degree? Are you thinking of taking a degree in your country or maybe abroad? Send us a voice message and tell us what you think. Try to practice some of the vocabulary that we've been speaking about. You could send us uh, an email or a voice message. Your voice message is should go to speakpipe, that's S-P-E-A-K-P-I-P-E dot com slash podcast, And there you have a maximum of 90 seconds to speak. 
And your emails can go to me, Craig, at inglespodcast.com. Or to me, Reza, at BelfastReza at gmail.com. And on next week's episode, Reza and I will be speaking about the past continuous. Until then, it's... it's goodbye from me. Oh, that was quick. And it's goodbye from him. Goodbye. The music in this podcast is by Pitts, and the track is called See You Later. For he's a jolly good, good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow, and so say all of us.